We have a, um, three short talks. Um, we had several abstracts uh, submitted for, um, for or short oral presentations, and they were all great, and they were um, evaluated, and we had to select, and that was all, that's always difficult, but in any case, we did. And I'm pleased to invite Amel uh, Islamzada, I hope I get that right, um, who is in Hong Shen's um, Ma's uh, lab in mechanical engineering. She's a graduate um, student there, and um, she's going to present some interesting findings. Hello everyone and thank you for letting me present. It's like this? Yeah. Okay, awesome, thank you. And I'm excited to have the opportunity to uh, present our current findings and our topic for today is malaria. So it is a blood infection that is caused by a, by a um, par parasite that is transmitted to human by a mosquito bite. Um, currently, there are 3.2 billion people that live in an area that poses risk for malaria transmission. There are five strains that can be transmitted to humans. Only one carrier, which is unfortunately very widespread and a common species. So when outbreaks do happen, they are quite hard to contain. Um, only in 2015, there were 212 million of new cases that led to about half a million deaths. Uh, arguably, the most deadly strain is Plasmodium falciparum. It is the one that leads to the uh, most complications. If untreated, it will lead to death. And it's the most common in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so the modern infection is by saliva of Anopheles mosquito. This little guy right here. And one, once it enters the body, it will first attack the liver where it matures into a form that can uh, go on and attack its main target, which is the red blood cell. Within the red blood cell, it can hide from immune system and replicate. Within 48 hours, it will release 8 to 12 spores into the bloodstream. So the spread is quite rapid. And it is this stage of malaria, the red blood cell stage, that causes the clinical manifestations of the disease. When left untreated, the, red blood cell, the infected cell accumulation can lead to a decreased perfusion and organ failure. Uh, Plasmodium falciparum has a quite a high mutation rate. Currently, there are uh, multiple resistant strains like DD2 and drug-sensitive strains like 3D7. And these two strains are the areas of our interest. But zooming in to what's happening in the individual red blood cells that's affected, First thing that happens is the parasite attacks hemoglobin of the red blood cell and degrades it for essential amino acids that are necessary for its survival. Now, this leads to a production of a toxic byproduct, heme. Heme is toxic to the parasite. Also, it causes oxidative stress on the cell. Under the oxidative stress, uh, the cell will become rigid and will be detected by splenic clearance. So what the parasite does to uh, counteract this, it turns heme into hemozoin, which is a crystallized form. It's inert, it can be safely stored in the food vacuole of the parasite. Um, and the cell, although it does uh, still become somewhat rigid because of the accumulation of hemozoin, it's a crystal, it does not become rigid enough to actually be cleared by splenic clearance. So the parasite can persist. And it is this mechanism that uh, anti-malarial drugs uh, aim, to, uh, aim to combat. If, there's no trans if, if, the hemozone is not turned, if the heme is not turned into hemozone, it will accumulate in a cell and be toxic towards the parasite. Also, there will be oxidative stress uh, on the red blood cell. It will become rigid and there will be host-mediated clearance of it as well. Now, this fact that the... Um, cell becomes rigid under drug treatment is what interests us in our lab. We tested a bunch of currently clinically available anti-malarial drugs. Uh, so here, control is DMSO, tetracycline is a positive control, and the rest are drugs including chlorocrine, artimeter, artesanate. Um, we've discovered that reduction of the red blood cell deformability is actually a common feature of all of these drugs. And thus, this uh, feature can be used as a biomarker, which leads me to our hypothesis that the deformability-based cell sorting can be used to distinguish 
drug-resistant and drug-sensitive parasites in a culture. So then our aims include to develop a sorting device that will uh, sort the red blood cells based on their deformability, evaluate this device uh, using uh, currently established drug-sensitive and drug-resistant strains. In our case, it's 3D7 and DD2. And then use deformability-based cell sorting to isolate drug-resistant parasites for further genome sequencing. Once we know the responsible mutation, we can use this mutation as a target for drug development. So this is our device. Uh, this is an actual picture of a device, and this is a schematic. So uh, it basically mimics the movement of red blood cells through the microvasculature. It consists of rows of constrictions, of pores through which the cells will move. Cells are introduced at the lower um, left corner and move horizontally and also move upwards towards the right. All of the cells will move horizontally, but only the ones deformable enough to actually squeeze through the constrictions will move upwards. Um, this way we actually get the deformability-based sorting of each individual cell. There are nine outlets. Outlet one corresponds to most deformable cells. They will go all the way up through all of the construction, even the really narrow ones at the top, where outlet nine is the more rigid ones so that will not be able to move really far up. This is how our device works. There we go. So the cells are introduced as they're moving towards the right and up. You will notice that their oscillatory movement downwards it's important to declog the device, so if the cell cannot move through, it will not be blocking the pore, it can still go through. Also, it ensures that there is an even pressure on every single individual cell, uh, which is important for accurate sorting. <coughs> so how we sort is we take either the DD2, which is the resistance strain, or 3D7, which is the sensitive strain, towards chloroquine. Uh, we incubate them for four hours with a drug, then we stain them with whole chest, and then we sort them based on their deformability. Image each individual outlet and count the number of infected cells in each one. The drug concentrations we're taking based on the reported IC50 values for chloroquine. You will notice that for 37, we can only go as high as one times IC50. Anything higher than that uh, will actually make the cells too rigid, uh, which will actually kill the cells, so we're not able to measure them. Where for uh, DD2, which is a resistant, we can actually go quite high in the concentration for treatment. And next comes our preliminary results. So this is the distribution of infected cells in each individual outlet from one to nine. And I'll remind again that one are the most deformable where nine are the most rigid cells. So controls look pretty similar. Controls are untreated cells. And then looking at the treated cells and looking at DD2, which is a resistance strain, even while being uh, treated with a pretty high concentration, this is 700.2 nanomolar of chloroquine, uh, the distribution in outlets doesn't change by a lot. It changed from being centered at mostly around three to around five where when you look at the sensitive strain, 3D7, you can find a lot more cells that are here in a more uh, rigid outlet. So outlet 7, quite a few cells, and outlet 8, which shows us that the microfluidic ratchet device can be used to distinguish the drug-resistant from drug-sensitive uh, falciparum strains after the drug treatment. So we're uh, using this to, for our next aim, which is to separate the uh, mixed culture with, the, uh, with resistant and sensitive um, drug resistant and drug sensitive uh, falciparum strains and to do genome sequencing on resistant ones. I thank all of our support and our affiliations and our lab for allowing me to do this research. Thank you. So we have time for a question. But we need a mic. That's a very nice uh, presentation. Only thing I'm curious is, as you know, the 
deformability changes a lot during stage of development. The yes. wing stage are quite deformable and mm -hmm. they become trophs and size and they become really rigid. So in the, did you see any difference in the parasitemia, stage of parasitemia, and the, uh, actually percentage of parasitemia during this treatment in your two systems? Yeah, actually I don't have it here, but I d we did do a research in our labs that was looking at separation of the infected cells based on their stage. And we can actually do a stage-based separation, uh, uh, sorting from uh, ring stage cells to late stage cells. So we can use this act to actually separate stage specifically as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. you know, at least in infected patients, yes. you never see late stages because they're all either stuck in the endothelial mm -hmm. cells or removed by the spleen. You only yeah. see ring stage. Mm -hmm. The only time you see late stages are people are splenectomized. And they get high parasitemia with very late mm. stages. So I think it's a nice way to kind of monitor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So those who are looking at programs realize that I decided to arbitrarily flip the order. <laughs> so Andrew, I didn't mean to skip you. Um, and Dr. Andrew Shi is a um, actually a new a newcomer to the um, to the uh, transfusion medicine program here at UBC. He's um, now on staff at, v at VGH. Make sure I get that right. And um, um, did his um, um, some fellowship training in um, transfusion medicine at McMaster. So we're pleased to have him here. Thank you, Andrew. All right, everyone. Uh, so as I said before, my name is Andrew C, and I'm one of the uh, new transfusion medicine specialists at the Vancouver Coastal Health Authority. And I'd like to thank the organizers of the Norman Bethune Symposium for uh, giving us a chance to speak on behalf of my team on uh, this uh, educational project. So um, I'd like to say that funding for this project was provided by the Canadian Blood Services Center for Innovation Blood Tech Net Competition Grant, but I otherwise have no other disclosures. And here are the objectives for my talk today. So let's just quickly move into some background. So could I get a show of hands for everybody here? Who uses social media here? <laughs> I think that's a pretty easy win. Who here uses uh, blogs or podcasts as a regular way to serve for entertainment? These are some of the ones that I use regularly. For example, I use Rotten Tomatoes to prioritize my Netflix queue because my time's important. Perfect. Okay. Now, who uses online educational resources um, other than reading journals online? A good example of this might be the Canadian Blood Services Professional Education website. Perfect. So you guys can probably see where I'm going with this. So the uh, Free Open Access Medical Education Movement, or the Foam Ed Movement, uh, uses the power of social media, blogs, podcasts, and other online resources to really promote best practices and engage in knowledge translation. And I think there's a bit of a push and pull between uh, a lot of these educational materials, between materials that are teacher-centered and learner-centered. So teacher-centered are probably more uh, traditional, where you have a bunch of experts, they provide the information, they structure it. Uh, however, these do have the drawback of maybe focusing too much on the interests of the expert, and they may miss practical applications. Where learner-centered materials are a little bit more democratically created. You know, what does me as a learner wants to learn? Um, oftentimes, these types of materials are more based around practical knowledge, and oftentimes get more buy-in for their use. However, they often lack structure, and they may not have cutting edge or even appropriate content, because me as a learner, if I don't know what I don't know, then I don't know to ask. So the um, idea was to really create, take the structure of the teacher-centered uh, materials and the practical knowledge of the learner-centered materials, and really combine it into a curriculum that uh, meant to teach uh, management of bleeding and thrombosis. And we chose this topic area just because it applies to so many different specialties as an area that requires constant updates of knowledge. So here are the methods. First, we started with something called an internal needs assessment, and then we moved on to a massive online needs assessment. And then now we're currently in the process of developing a curriculum. I'll take you through this process now. So the internal needs assessment, we essentially saw that within our group, could we stump each other to essentially estimate what needs might exist? And this group initially started out with staff hematologists, ER physicians, and a PhD clinician. Um, they actually didn't have transfusion medicine in mind whatsoever. And when they asked me, um, they asked me actually to provide hematology input because my background is as a clinical hematologist. Uh, we all decided to come up with case scenarios that were multiple choice. Uh, we based them around difficult uh, hematology emergency room cases. 
And um, this gave me a bit of an evil idea. So um, this was my case. So this is a 42-year-old gentleman who was post-motor vehicle accident, brought to the trauma bay on warfarin and requiring emergent transfusion. And some of the topics that uh, the questions covered were reversal of warfarin and adjunct treatment for bleeding, appropriate red cells to transfuse, and monitoring during a massive transfusion protocol. So nothing too horribly difficult. And uh, certainly I'm not asking esoteric things like, what is an anti garbage antibody? But, you know, surprisingly or unsurprisingly, uh, when I distributed this to the rest of my group, and keep in mind, these are all staff fairly fresh out of training, um, they didn't do very well. So uh, TM was actually made part of the, part of the curriculum. Um, so I was sort of transformed into their TM content expert. And I think very unique to one of these programs, we actually, I actually fought to get a TM uh, MLT on board to this uh, educational program, just to sort of provide the blood bank side of things. So we moved on to our massive online needs assessment. And I think this can be best summed up with this really famous Donald Rumsfeld quote. So our perceived needs are our known unknowns. So these are the things that learners know they don't know and want to learn. Um, your unperceived needs are your unknown unknowns. That is the things that people don't know they don't know, and therefore we should teach them that. So we got, went about this in two different ways. So for the perceived needs, we asked simply, what would you like to learn? And we gave a drop-down menu and also a free text box for, so people could put in their answers. And we also asked respondents to describe a difficult clinical scenario and specifically asked, why was this difficult? For the unperceived needs, we modified our internal needs assessments and essentially added one common mistake answer. And we a priori decided that if our respondents got more than 50% wrong, we would identify this as a knowledge gap and therefore this would be an opportunity for us to teach people. So we did a bit of a social media blitz. Uh, we all use our own personal uh, social media accounts. Uh, the Canadian EM, uh, the uh, emergency medicine uh, social media phone website, also did a social media blitz as well. And this led to our results. So after about two months of this, we got about 200 responses, a uh, response rate of about 20%. We got responses all across the world, as you can see from this map over here. The types of providers that responded, surprisingly, were uh, practicing clinicians, not residents or medical students. Um, and keep in mind, there's a bit of a selection bias here. Um, and this also included some paramedics and nurses as well. But I really think the fact that more practicing physicians answer this really represents an opportunity to uh, get at practicing clinicians to change their practice. Unsurprisingly, uh, the specialties of providers that uh, responded were emergency medicine physicians and internal medicine subspecialties. Um, and I think one of the needs that we've seen within our group is we want to get specialties from uh, people from other specialties involved so we can sort of broaden out um, our reach. And these are the perceived needs. So in terms of issues around acute bleeding, people from a transfusion perspective most wanted to know about adjunct treatments for acute bleeding and massive transfusion protocols. For the treatments and therapy side, uh, reversal of anticoagulants and treatment of coagulopathies uh, were uh, garnered the most interest. However, I should note that appropriateness of transfusion, adverse effects of transfusion, and periprocedural tr triggers for transfusion all had much lower rates of interest, rating around sort of 30 to 50 percent, which I think leads us very well to our unperceived needs. So again, these were very much our, um, this was sort of a modification of the internal needs assessment I did, and essentially response rates were dismal. Um, and essentially, these were all found to be knowledge gaps. And I think, again, this represents an opportunity to teach clinicians about where transfusion medicine is important in their daily clinical practice. So we're currently in the process of developing a curriculum right now. And this is being developed independently by a hematology fellow. And it was really important that this process was done independently. So again, the experts didn't get involved. And this was based on the data, and it was learner-based. This is going to be released in blocks prioritized by our needs assessments using sources of data and priority of need. And we've developed sort of an initial curriculum map right now. And this table down here sort of represents some of the topics we wish to cover. Each block will be uh, uh, bookended by a case to sort of explain all these different uh, concepts. So in conclusion, online curricula are ideally both learner-centered and structured. Management of bleeding and thrombosis is felt to be a universally important topic requiring updates and knowledge, and it was found through our internal needs assessments that transfusion medicine concepts are key. Our massive online needs assessment reveal both perceived and unperceived needs, and we will use this information to develop a curriculum. Um, I'd like to give a special thanks uh, to my team here, especially our intrepid medical student, David Joe, who really put together these assessments. Uh, Dr. Eric Seng, who's a hematology fellow who's putting together the curriculum map. And Dr. Teresa Chan, who's really uh, the mastermind behind this whole project and uh, really has become a leader in FOMED. 
Um, and finally, Sophie Charger, who uh, encouraged me to apply for the grant, and the rest of the Center for Innovation at King of Blood Services uh, for giving me this chance. So with that, um, I'd like to ask if anybody has any questions, and please, if you want to help create content, please email me at that email address. Um, I have never written an educational blog in my life, and I'm being taught at this very moment how to do so, so I would be happy to help pass that knowledge or connect you to the right people so you can learn that skill set as well. So thank you. That was a wonderful talk. So if I could add an addendum to Donald Rumsfeld's comments. Uh, the other danger is what you think you know that just ain't so. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, it, so, you know, with, with medical knowledge doubling about every six or seven years, uh, rather, in addition to the content needed to, for training, I wonder if you think that this also provides rationale for developing, you know, some type of application where you can help people with their decision tree. Uh, you know, I just wonder, you had, you had about a 30% correct answer uh, from trained people. M makes you worry a little. So is there an iPhone app in our future? Well, uh, I think it's actually an interesting idea. Believe it or not, we have, uh, and not, I'm not saying this just because you asked the question, but we have been tossing this around within our group internally about whether or not, uh, if we develop an app to help people kind of with their decision making. We think that at the very least getting people involved in this educational curriculum will be a way to sort of uh, let people know about the app as well. So we, we hope to sort of broach people by sort of providing that educational experience and then once we come up with the app say, hey, this is an addendum to our educational curriculum that we can also use to help your decision making. Thank you. Thank you. And they'll grab you for more questions, Thank I'm you. sure. Thanks. <laughs> So our next speaker is um, Hugh Kim. You got 30 slides, Hugh. How are you going to do that? Where are you? There you are. And he wore a tie. Holy moly. OK, so many of you, most of you know Hugh. He's a, um, a dentist, a periodontist, a PhD scientist. He has tickets to the Canucks. He's a great guy. He's my neighbor in terms of my lab and my office. And um, he does some amazing research. So we're pleased to have him here. Hugh. Well, thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I was going to suggest skipping to slide number 29 if you really wanted to, but, uh, but, I, but, I, but, I, but I do promise that I'll be brief. Uh, so I, I did want to uh, take a little bit of time just to describe uh, some of the work that we do in my lab on uh, the role of platelet signaling in chronic inflammation using uh, periodontitis or periodontal disease or gum disease as a model. So I'll start first by uh, giving a little bit of context on, on the role of platelets in, in, uh, in chronic inflammation. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about periodontitis or gum disease as a model for chronic inflammation as well, and I'll describe some of the data that, uh, that uh, two of my recent graduate students have, uh, have produced on the subject. So first, uh, it's fairly well recognized at this point. See, Adam, already at slide number four. Uh, 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 it, it's fairly well recognized at this point that platelets are important for more than just coagulation, um, and, that they're, that they're, um, that, and that there's a fair amount of indirect evidence to, to point to their importance in, um, in, in chronic infl uh, inflammatory disorders. Uh, so as we know, uh, platelets contain a, a vast array of cytokines and growth factors within the granules that are released upon activation. Perhaps most notably, platelet factor 4, which, uh, which is one of the cytokines that uh, makes up a, um, uh, a, a large proportion of the alpha granules uh, and that does have documented pro-inflammatory properties. And so the, the research that I'll, be, uh, that I'll be describing here will, um, uh, will look at the, will test the general hypothesis that platelet factor 4 uh, plays a role in chronic inflammation. So with regards to periodontitis or gum disease as a model, I'll first uh, describe very quickly the, the structure of the periodontal tissues that support our teeth, also known as the periodontium, and describe very briefly uh, a couple of the major aspects of the pathogenesis of periodontal disease. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about a cell culture study model as well as some uh, work that we've, um, that we've done uh, using human samples. 
So first, uh, very briefly, uh, so on, on, on the left we have some teeth, and uh, what the, the, the schematic, the inset schematic on the right hand side uh, represents the, uh, the cross section of a single tooth and the, and the tissues that support it. So the tissues that support the tooth are collectively known as a periodontium. So the roots of our teeth are anchored in the bone uh, through a periodontal ligament, and then the soft tissue covering, the gingiva or gum tissue, uh, covers the bone, and the gingival fibroblast is the primary, primary cellular constituent um, of the connected tissue. So what happens in gum disease is that the, uh, the gram-negative bacteria, uh, specifically the lipopolysaccharide or LPS component of the dental plaque, induces an inflammatory response which uh, leads to the recruitment of, um, of white blood cells to the dentogingival junction or the, or the tooth-gum interface. Uh, and one of the signaling mechanisms um, involved in the degradation of the tissues during gum disease is the release of MMPs, matrix metalloproteases, from the resident fibroblasts uh, under, the, under the influence of uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines. So what we wanted to look at first is uh, whether or not platelet factor four might be one of these pro-inflammatory cytokines to, to promote the degradation of, of uh, periodontal tissues. So what I'm uh, about to present here was recently published in the Journal of Periodontal Research, and this was the work uh, done by Mohamed uh, uh, Javaid, um, my former master's student. So very briefly, uh, this study involved cultured human gingival fibroblasts um, in the presence or absence of recombinant platelet factor four. So what we found, uh, uh, what Mo found uh, on the, on, as depicted in the graph on the left-hand side, is that recombinant platelet factor IV triggered a significant increase in the amount of pro-MMP1 secreted by the cultured human gingival fibroblast. On the right-hand side, as determined by real-time PCR, is that platelet factor IV uh, induced an increase in MMP1 gene expression. So uh, these data are consistent with uh, like a pro-inflammatory role for PF4 in the context of uh, periodontal disease. So what we then, then uh, also did in parallel with this uh, study is that we, did, uh, we conducted some studies based on um, uh, laboratory analyses of human samples. So gingival curricular fluid is a fluid that um, accumulates at the uh, dentogingival junction, so the, the sulcus or the space between the tooth and the gum. And so uh, the gingival curricular fluid, or GCF, uh, is a useful diagnostic tool since the, the, the cytokine constituents reflect the local inflammatory state of that particular site. So this is the work of uh, Mathieu Noe, uh, another one of my former graduate students. And this uh, gingival curricular fluid uh, can be readily collected as shown here through with, uh, with the micropipette. And so what Matt did is that he collected gingival curricular fluid from sites of periodontal health, uh, secondly from sites with gingivitis, so that's with the initial, uh, the initial stages of gum disease, uh, but it's still in the reversible state, um, and then finally in sites with advanced disease, also known as periodontitis. So what Matt found is, uh, first, the, on the left-hand side, there's a, a fluorescence micrograph of a cytosmin preparation from a gingival curricular fluid sample. So what Matt found uh, was that there, during perinatal inflammation, that there was a definite recruitment of platelets to the gingival, uh, dental gingival junction under conditions of inflammation. And so this is quantified in two ways. Uh, the graph in the middle represents um, the mean platelet counts from the various, uh, from the various disease categories um, based on counts of microscopy. And on the right-hand side, uh, based on quantification, ELISA quantification of uh, GP2B3A uh, in the gingival curricular fluid. So both of these data sets uh, uh, indicate that, that the platelets are recruited to the dental gingival junction under conditions of inflammation. Now, perhaps most notably, when Matt analyzed the gingival curricular fluid samples for platelet factor four content, that there was about a 20-fold um, increase in the amount of PF4 under conditions of periodontitis. So in, in, in those samples that exhibited advanced gum disease, there was a much higher concentration of platelet factor four locally. Um, so uh, we also... Uh, uh, try to take a uh, systemic approach to analyzing the role of platelet factor four in conditions of, um, of periodontitis. And so for this, um, Matt uh, recruited blood donors uh, uh, from these, again, these th uh, three major categories of patients. So patients with completely healthy periodontium, 
patients with gingivitis and patients with uh, advanced periodontitis. Um, so the, the, uh, these blood donors had to be uh, uh, systemically healthy, completely medication-free, and they had to be non-smokers. Um, so we had to think of creative ways to get blood donors, and this was actually the, possibly the, uh, the most effective way that we got. Uh, we did get one very enthusiastic volunteer that didn't even meet the inclusion criteria. But just to be clear, that was a joke. We didn't actually give beer for blood. So. <laughs> Uh, so the blood samples were, um, uh, were, were treated to isolate the platelets and also to isolate the plasma. And when we had the platelets isolated uh, in suspension, we uh, treated them with an agonist, a specific agonist in this case was a lipopolysaccharide from a periodontal pathogen, Porphyromonas gingivalis, to engage the TLR4 receptors on the platelets. And then we separated the platelets and we analyzed the releasate content for platelet factor 402 to basically test the reactivity of these platelets under these, uh, from these different patients, um, and the reactivity was measured based on the amount of platelet factor force secreted. So what we found, or what Matt found, is that the circulating platelet factor four levels in the, uh, in, in the plasma was significantly higher in patients with severe periodontitis compared to healthy controls or patients with the reversible gingivitis. And secondly, uh, when the isolated platelets were treated with uh, Porphyromonas gingivalis LPS, uh, the platelets isolated from patients with severe periodontitis had a much higher uh, proportion of platelet factor IV release, indicating that uh, the platelets, um, A, contain more platelet factor IV, and also that they were more reactive to, to the stimulation from the gram-negative pathogens. So collectively, these data show us uh, that platelet factor IV promotes MMP release and is also more abundant both locally and systemically in patients and at sites that exhibit severe periodontitis compared to periodontal health, uh, which point to a novel association between platelet activation and chronic inflammation uh, in the context of the periodontitis model. Um, from, perhaps from a broader perspective, may provide more insight into the, the role of platelets and platelet factor IV in various chronic inflammatory conditions. So now for a public service announcement. Um, it, it, is, it, it is fairly well documented, and this is not fake news, that uh, about <laughs> half of the population, adult population, does have some form of periodontitis. So um, my, my specialties academy the, and in, in Canada and, and, and especially in the United States are, are um, going to a fair amount of effort to, to engage the public and raise awareness um, as to the, the prevalence and the importance of, of, of gum disease. And uh, this is, uh, can be easily screened um, at the dentist's office just by the use of a periodontal probe. And, and all adults should have uh, a probing exam done at least once a year to, to screen for the presence uh, of, of periodontitis uh, because it, it, is, it is definitely treatable. And on that note, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my former students whose work that I, uh, that, that I showed here, um, Matt No and uh, Mohamed Javaid, who've now moved on to bigger and better things, uh, are uh, numerous collaborators and, and individuals that provided us with a lot of technical assistance. Um, my laboratory is supported, uh, equipped by um, a grant from the Canadian Foundation for Innovation, uh, and CIHR is the source um, of my operating funding and my clinician scientist salary award. So thank you very much. So, um, just before you, so you're gonna, he's going to set up a clinic just in the corner over there during lunchtime. It's 10 bucks per, per probe, and the money goes to the CBR, of course. <laughs> Well, well, if the CBR is getting 10 bucks, then my fee is 20. <laughs> okay, we do have one question. I need a mic. Need a mic. Thank. Uh, very interesting. So, do you think these changes in the platelets are a cause or effect of the periodontitis? It, it, it's difficult to know for. Sure. It's actually difficult to know for sure because it, 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 it's well documented that that bacteria from the mouth do enter the bloodstream. So there could be a feedback mechanism by which the by which the platelets are reacting to that, or it could be the platelets that are recruited first and locally secreting uh, locally secreting platelet factor four at the at at at, at the sulcus. So it's, so it's actually difficult to know, but actually both are possible. So. We'll take one more. Just slide it over to you. Thanks. 
Uh, I was just curious, um, is there, do you have any evidence that treatment of the periodontitis actually decreases the platelet f factor for production? At this point we don't, because okay. all we have is basically, uh, basically data that we got from samples that we collected, so, yeah. One more, Peter's thinking. <laughs> so, so you know this guy Steve Kerrigan in, in Dublin uh, uh, has shown, along with Dermot Cox, that bacteria that get coated, that probably enter at these places, get coated with antibodies and the antibodies bind to platelet FC gamma R2A and cause release of platelet alpha granule contents, among which is platelet factor four. So that might be, in response to your question, the, the beginning parts of all that this is going on. Mm. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. I'm handing the mic over. Hold on a second. Okay, we'll tag team this. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Mohan Narla. It's my uh, pleasure to, to uh, have him agree to come and speak to us today. Uh, Mohan has a, has a long, august uh, career in red cell biology, and he's going to talk to us a bit today about his insights into some aspects of red cell biology and erythropoiesis, particularly as they relate to transfusion medicine. Uh, Mohan is, uh, has fairly recently finished a tour of duty as the Vice President of Research at the New York Blood Center, uh, where he still is the head of the Laboratory of Red Cell Physiology in the uh, Kimball Research Institute, which is part of the New York Blood Center. Uh, Mohan. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to uh, come back to Vancouver. It's one of my favorite cities. In contrast to my friend Peter, who is the first time, this is my 100th visit, I think, to <laughs> Vancouver or something like that. And I stopped counting a long time ago because I used to come every year three or four times to work at UBC with Evan Evans. We had a 22-year continuously funded grant on sickle cell disease from NHLBI. So I'm very familiar. I can, don't need a map to walk around downtown uh, Vancouver at all. So. In terms of the title of the talk, it was inspired. I asked Dana, what do you want me to talk about? Because I've been working on red cells for 40 years, so I've done all sorts of things. So she said, do something that's relevant to transfusion medicine. So I'm trying to put together what some of the work we did in the context of transfusion medicine. I must also say that, as I said, I've been working since my PhD thesis from 1969 on red cells and has continued all these years. And my daughter, who's a pediatric uh, hematologist at Stanford, says, my dad is a pretty nice guy, but how can you work on a red cell? A cell without a nucleus doesn't do anything except go around the circulation and still get excited every day to go to work. So, <laughs> and so to, to please them, because obviously parents want to please their children, so about seven or eight years ago, I started working on red cells. I started working on erythropoiesis so that I can work on a nucleated red cell, you know, so <laughs> I'm going to talk about it later on in the, last, the second part of the talk. Just putting in the context of people in the room, as most of you know, all of us while we're sitting and you're listening to me right now, you're making about two million red cells every second you're sitting here in the room. And on average, the human red cells circulate about 120 days, plus or minus 10 days. And in since in, in terms of transfusion medicine, a unit of blood has two trillion red cells. So this is in context of what I'm going to talk later about making red cells in vitro. This is a big number. Two trillion is a lot of red cells to make in a controlled fashion that are high quality and reproducibly to make two trillion cells. That's what challenge we face in terms of making what you call designer red cells or design platelets. Platelets at least are order of magnitude less, but still it's a big number here. Then the other important thing in the context of my talk is the fact that although the, the non-nucleated red cells, basically one of the stringent criteria for their survival is ability to deform. And we heard earlier about the malaria and red cell loss of deformability and stuff like that. So basically the red cell is eight microns in diameter and the capillaries through which they go through is about two to three microns in diameter. So it really has to squeeze through by changing their shape and deformation. And the most critical part of the, this test is when the red cell goes from, through the spleen, where in about 10% of the blood flow through the spleen, I'll show you later, has to go uh, open, goes into circulation, and uh, gets to get out of the spleen by actually transiting these, these narrow endothelial slits, which are only about half a micron wide, you know, and have one micron thick. So it really, you can see what an extensive deformation the red cell has to go through to 
uh, circulation in this plane. So what I'm going to briefly talk to you today is two things in terms of transfusion medicine, is in terms of red cell, mature red cell biology, what is widely called a storage lesion. We heard it again previously about platelet storage lesion. I'm going to talk about red cell storage lesion. And in the second half, I'm going to talk to a little bit about how we can eventually try to make red cells in vitro of high quality to be able to use for various reasons. I'm very glad to see my friend, old friend, Bob Card from Saskatoon, because I got into transfusion medicine because of him. He came to spend a sabbatical with me at UCSF in, uh, I don't know, 30, 40, 35 years ago or something like that. I was not doing anything on stored red cells, but he was really wanted to work on stored red cells because we developed a machine to measure red cell deformability and he wanted to use the machine to see what happens during storage to red cell deformability. And basically, this, the, I didn't know he was going to be here, but I put the slide anyway, you know, because I wanted to uh, thank him for getting me involved in uh, transfusion medicine. And we had a couple of papers on this subject, and basically, one was actually with a very famous transfusion medicine, Dr. Mollison. He came to visit me and Bob while I was there, and he said, oh, you get measuring all these things. What does it mean, you know? What, is there any useful information out of all these measurements? I said, we think so, because if the red cells lose deformability, they won't be able to circulate and they'll be removed by the, in the circulation after transfusion. So he says, okay, I can test your hypothesis. I said how he told us that uh, he has repeatedly studied six donors, and five of them store very well, one of them doesn't store well, you know, to post-transfusion viability. So he said, I'm going to send you these bags without uh, blinders, and you do your tests and tell me back, you know, which is the bad unit. You know, I said, okay, we'll try it, you know. So he sent us this bag from England, and we tested it, and it turned out we were able to predict. So this is a paper with uh, Dr. Mollison and Bob and I in the British Journal of Hematology. So at least this gave us some confidence what we are measuring has some physiology. Don't get me wrong, it's not all that clear cut, but at least there's a real good reason to believe this loss of deformability is a real important determinant of post-transfusion viability of uh, transfused red cells. Subsequently, this is all done about 30 years ago. Now there's a lot of interest in storage lesion. Everybody gets, you know, measuring these things and different parameters and try to correlate what they're measuring with uh, a post-transfusion viability. And one of the things that do all of you know in the room is the longer you store, there's more release of hemoglobin into the uh, uh, supernatants. So clearly the red cells are losing surface area and membrane and they're also losing some hemoglobin. And you can again see over a period of 40 days, you get a significant increase in heme concentration in the supernatant. The other thing we all already heard earlier, too, is microparticle formation. Clearly, as you store the uh, uh, red cells in the blood bag, over a period of 32 days, you get more and more uh, microparticles. You can see here there is a log scale, so you get almost a 10 to 15-fold increase in microparticle formation during storage for about six weeks. So clearly, these are all happening during storage. And they, to summarize what has been published for many, many, many years is really these are the kinds of changes you see. One thing is that there's a rapid decline in intercellular 2,3-DPG. Within a few days, the 2,3-DPG is gone from the stored red cells. And that's really an implication for oxygen delivery because it changes the oxygen affinity of the red cells. But clearly, I assume that when you transfuse them, it comes back, it'll take a while to regenerate 2,3-DPG in the transfused cells. And there's a gradual decrease in intercellular ATP, and there's very good evidence there's a lot of oxidative damage doing this thing. And there's some support for this comes from the fact that people have attempted to store red cells in anaerobic conditions in the presence of xenon or nitrogen and all, and clearly you can keep them for longer. But it's practically, it's very difficult to do that in the context of storage in the centers, but clearly it is proof of concept that oxidant damage does play a role in the storage lesion. And as I showed you, there's release of microparticles in hemoglobin. And the important thing I want to take message to give you is this, this microparticle re release and membrane sh uh, shedding results in loss of surface area of the red cells. And the surface area of the red cells is a critical determinant because the red cell has a surface area of about 140 square microns and a volume of 50, uh, 90 femtoliters. So it gives a lot of excess surface area for the given volume that that cell has. And this is why it's able to deform and change its shapes to so many different ways, because all of these deformations are ex uh, happening 
because the cells are able to have this excess surface area. The minute you st start losing surface area and they become more and more spherical, they're not able to tran transit through the spleen and I've provided direct evidence how much surface area the red cell can tolerate prior to being removed by the human spleen. So the, why is the surface area being lost? And I can tell you there's reasonably strong evidence. It is because the lipid bilayer and the red cell spectrum-based membrane skeleton are linked very tightly by these uh, various bridging proteins in the red cell membrane. And whenever you lose this linkage between the lipid bilayer and the membrane skeleton, you start shedding surface area and microparticles and things like that. These microparticles, if you look carefully, they don't have any uh, skeletal components. They don't have spectrum or actin at all. They only have membrane proteins. So it's really selective uh, de detachment of the lipid bilayer from the skeleton that's responsible for microparticle generation and loss of surface area. So I spent a sabbatical in Paris about in Pasteur Institute about eight or nine years ago. The reason I went there is because the people there are obviously very much interested in malaria, and they're actually trying to do a, a role of spleen in malaria infections. So a very talented physician scientist, Pierre Buffet, was trying to develop a perfusion system with human spleens. So the idea is to actually have an isolated human spleen, perfuse red cells through them, and see how long they can circulate ex vivo you know, intact human spleen. And the way they get the human spleen is this is patients with some pancreatic cancers where the spleen is removed along with the uh, thing. So they get about maybe one or two spleens every week because all the surgeries are performed only in two hospitals in Paris, so it's really a, a centralized kind of thing. So what they did was basically to use this uh, system, and I told them that I would like to come and uh, see how they do it and what we can use it for other red cell disorders and stuff like that. So basically, the important thing to remember about the human spleen, which is different from the mice, is that basically there are two types of circulation, open circulation and a closed circulation. 90% of the blood flow through the spleen is through the closed circulation. The other 10% is open circulation. That means the blood is being dumped into the tissues, in the uh, splenic cord, red, uh, uh, red pulp, and then the red cells have to come out into circulation by going through these splenic slits. So that's where the control of uh, quality of the red cell comes through is during this uh, open circulation. And you can actually see this is actually a red cell going through the slit in one of these perfused spleens with a scanning here. You can see the marked deformation of the red cell. So the whole system was set up is basically, as I said, the perfusion system. You take the spleen, you know, you circulate. It's very beautifully done with complete control of temperature, gases, uh, measuring every 15 minutes lactate, pH, and all those things, so you know that the spleen is metabolically active and is not. So, and you can keep this going on for about 24 hours quite well. You know, then obviously things you can't do any further. So what, if they published a number of nice papers, that's one of the things I mentioned earlier about malaria. If you take parasite-infected cells and put them into this human spleen, you can see the ring stage cells, about 60 to 80 percent, are in circulation for at least 10 hours or 12 hours. But if you put later stages like trophozoids or schizons, they're all removed within five minutes or to 10, 15 minutes. So it's really a very efficient filtering system. So what I wanted to do with them, basically, was use red cells, normal red cells, and make red cells with reduced surface area. So basically, induce microbial particle formation and reduce the surface area of the cells. And you can do that very easily with red cells by treating them with a naturally occurring lipid called lysolecithin. So as you increase the concentration of lysolecithin, the red cells become more and more progressively echinocytic. And finally, as shown here, you can actually see the release of microparticles at high concentration of uh, lysolecithin, and eventually you get spherocytes. Basically, so what, it, and this is documented on the left-hand side where you can see the diameter is going down because they're really more and more spherical and also the surface area is going down. So you can actually uh, produce red cells with very controlled loss of surface area by treating with lysolecithin. So what is done is, again, to show that we're really losing deformability, this is the instrument I worked out with Marcel Bessis when I was a postdoc in Paris in the 70s. It's called ectocytometer, whatever, whatever it is worth. Anyway, this is the one 
the Bob Card came to work with me to measure the deformability of stored red cells. And what you can show here is actually, as you do more and more loss of surface area, the red cells are not becoming as elliptical, so they basically are less deformable. And you can actually quantitate the surface area loss as a function of loss of cell deformability of these cells. So what, this, what we did in Pasteur was basically we created all these lysolestin treated cells. Since we have one, spleen is such a complicated thing, and to set up these experiments, what uh, uh, Innocent and Pierre did a very clever thing. We get all these cells, we make, mark them with different dyes, okay, and mix them together and put them back so that in the same spleen, we can look at the survival of four different, five different populations of cells in the same experiment. And so that if you do five or six experiments or seven experiments, we actually get about 30, 40 data points of different surface areas. And you can see clearly here, as you increase the surface area loss, the splenic retention rate goes up. And when you lose about 18% of the surface area of the red cells, they're completely removed by the spleen within, you know, uh, first passage or second passage through the spleen. So it really shows in vivo, you know, not in vivo, but at least in ex vivo system, and the control condition, the spleen is a really important organ for sensing loss of surface area of red cells. And this is really makes a lot of sense because as most of hematologists in this room know, one way to treat patients with hereditary spherocytosis is take out the spleen. You know, the hemoglobin goes up, the reticulocyte goes down. So really it's been known for a long time that spleen is one of the most important quality control in terms of determining red cell survival, not undermine the fact that other things happen, but this is one of the fundamental roles of spleen is quality control of red cells. So basically, as what I have to show you is that human spleen is extremely efficient in sequestering spherocytic red cells, and red cells losing greater than 80%, 18% of surface area or 27% reduction in surface to volume ratio rapidly cleared within the spleen. And I think there's reasonably convincing evidence that really this loss of surface area is really the, one of the major determinants of uh, uh, decreased survival uh, post-transfusion of stored red cells. And uh, actually what uh, Pierre Buffet and his colleagues are doing right now in Paris is basically to show that uh, store at different uh, times of uh, storage and put them back into the human spleen and document if you can show variability in storage from donor to donor. Is it only three minutes? I thought mine was 25 minute talk, no? Really? Sorry. Okay. 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 The, uh, I could have adjusted it, but uh, I, okay. The, uh, before closing the storage business, though, I think, as, be, as most of you heard, there's a lot of interest in this new versus old blood for transfusion. Since I was at the blood center, I used to get calls from my colleagues. Uh, my family member is getting uh, surgery and transfusion. Can you make sure they get new blood? I said, what are you talking about? You know? <laughs> I don't control blood supply anyway, but nevertheless. A lot of calls after this paper was published in New England Journal. So, but I think my feeling at reading all the data so far is there's really no meaningful differences uh, uh, in the studies so far performed trying to demonstrate old and new blood. And I, my own bias based on everything we know about red cell physiology, I think there's going to be very little difference if you keep it for less than four weeks. There's very little change takes place before four weeks. It's subsequent four to six to eight weeks that's when things are really falling apart in terms of red cell function. And one thing I want to mention is me and Dana Devine were at a meeting organized by NHLBI when this controversy came and they were trying to design these studies. And Dana made a very important point in my judgment, which is that you know, all these studies basically do not take into account the processing of the thing. You know, there's really no control in terms of the storage hematocrats or how these things are handled and all those kinds of things. And how can you do these massive studies without control of the starting material itself in these studies? And people say, yeah, that's important, but subsequent studies never took care of this very carefully in my judgment anyway. And I think the biological variability of uh, storability of red cells is an issue, and it's a very difficult issue to address on a large-scale study, but it's something we need to think about all the time. You know? And finally, when my friends call them, I tell them, don't worry, most of the units, 85 to 90 percent of the units of the New York Blood Center are less than two weeks old. Only things we keep for six weeks are things people don't want to use anyway, so really it's not an issue for me, this whole thing. 
So now, so I'm a little confused, but anyway, I'll try to finish this. Uh, as I said earlier, I'm, in the last five, seven years, I've really started getting more interested in how red cells are actually made and how we, you know, the bone marrow makes this so many, two million red cells and high quality control. Oh, how do we do that? So as Peter already said, all of these blood cells, you know, whether it's platelets or white cells or red cells, the origin is all human, you know, hematopoietic stem cells. And the thing to remember is, I think it's true for all lineages, is from the hematopoietic stem cell to get a red cells into circulation is a very complicated process. And actually there are at least eight or nine defined stages in this process of coming from the stem cell to the red cells. And what usually people talk about, where is the, uh, to move this thing, sorry. Pointer kind of thing. Pad? Oh, no. oh, okay. Uh, I'm not very good at this computer stuff. Okay. <laughs> okay. So basically, the, what people define it, the stem cell first generate what they call erythroid progenitor cells. Huh? These are called burst forming unit and colony forming units. The first recognizable erythroblast in our bone marrow is called proerythroblast. The reason we can recognize it morphologically is they're making hemoglobin. So if you stain for globin, you can see globin in these cells. That's really the first recognizable stage. And that undergoes about four to five mitosis in the bone marrow before it extrudes its nucleus to generate a nucleate reticular site. It's a very active process of remo getting rid of the nucleus, which is rapidly phagocytosed by the macrophages in the bone marrow. What we don't know very much is exactly from the stem cell to the proerythroblast, how many cell divisions are there. You know, is it seven divisions or eight divisions? We have no idea, and that's something we are actively pursuing in the lab. So the whole thing with making red cells came about because of this really very important work by uh, Etienne Feebach in uh, Jerusalem, where he published in 1989 a very nice system to take CD34 cells from humans and actually differentiate them over a period of 18 to 20 days to get reticular sites. It's a two-phase system where in the first phase you use uh, erythropoietin stem cell factor and IL-3 and generate a lot of erythroid progenitors. This is BFUs and CFUs. And then at the end of the first stage, you just put them in the presence of EPO only, which is the erythropoietin, which is important for terminal erythroid differentiation. And then they undergo this four to five mitosis next to the nucleus and able to generate reticular site. So we started using the system five, six years ago. And since there are so many stages, and if you really want to understand how these cells are put together, you really understand to work with very pure populations of cells. We just can't put in culture and take a certain days and say we understand what is going on. So we really spend a lot of time trying to isolate very pure populations of all these different stages during terminal erythropoiesis. And the first thing we did was to really see if we can get very pure populations of progenitors BFUEs and CFUEs. Uh, using surface markers, and we found that using three surface markers, CD34, CD36, and IL3 receptor, we were able to get highly purified populations of BFUE. For example, if in this uh, CD34 positive, CD36 negative, IL3 receptor negative, if you put 200 cells into methylcellulose, we get about 170 to 180 colonies, so they're about 80% pure. Similarly, we are able to isolate very pure populations of CFE. So now we have a handle on exactly what these cells are and what the biology of these cells are. You know, I can show you the data and culture, but really, are they really different or not? So nowadays, a lot of people use RNA sequencing to see what genes are expressed in these different cell populations. And just to show you here, actually, we compare CD34 to BFU to CFU to proerythroblast. We can get distinct patterns such as giving us a lot of confidence that we really know that these are very different stages of erythroid differentiation. So then subsequently we wanted to also get very pure populations of all the way from proerythroblast to the reticular side stage, the terminal differentiation. Clearly we under set of markers. We looked at a lot of markers and the two we picked finally was glycophorin A, which is very erythroid specific, and alpha-4 integrin and band 3, which is an anion transporter. And you can see at the early stages when you have proerythroblast, they are expressing high quantities of alpha-4 and very low amount of band-3. But as they differentiate more and more into reticular sites, you can see alpha-4 is going down and band-3 is increasing, so you get this waterfall kind of a, 
uh, changes in the thing. So basically by taking two markers, one is going down, the other going up, we're able to get very pure populations of uh, cell. And just to show you by sorting these different uh, gates with high alpha-4, low band-3, all the way to high, low alpha-4 and band-3, we can really get 85 to 90% pure erythroblasts at every distinct stage of development. So we really feel very comfortable that we can now really study this process in a meaningful way. And actually, again, just to show you, these are really distinct populations. We can actually segregate them by sequencing uh, RNA-seq analysis and so So just to, since uh, I'm good for running a little bit of time here, we have also recently published a paper where we actually, all this is RNA-seq data, huh? so all it says is the message is there. Are there actually proteins being made or not, you know, with this message? And we actually had a paper recently with some colleagues in France where we quantitated precisely about 6,000 proteins, number of copies in each of these stages of erythroblast. You know, so, and the RNA-seq and protein go hand in hand most of the time, not all the time. So we really feel we now have a very strong foundation to study erythroid differentiation in humans. And I will tell you, we also did some work with mouse, and we published a paper in blood that 70% of the genes that are expressed in humans are expressed in mouse, but 30% are completely different. So you really have to, when you compare species, you really have to worry about similarities and differences between different species. So in the last three or four minutes, I just want to show, because uh, what uh, Peter did beautifully earlier is the first attempt to make in vitro red cells for transfusion was by this group, Luc Dier's group in uh, France. And they published this paper in 2005 in Nature Biotechnology. And basically what they did was take CD34 cells from cord blood and again using the same factors I talked about, stem cell factor or IL-3 and thing. But they also used, used stromal red cells, stromal cells to finish the maturation process because without the absence of the stromal cells, they couldn't get very good enucleation. So enucleation depended on the interaction of the erythroblast with the stromal cell. And what they did were able to actually show that by day 18, you get a lot of enucleated cells huh, in this culture system. And basically, they measured all the parameters, oxygen affinity, deformability, they're all pretty normal. So really, there's a first proof of concept that you can actually generate from CD34 cells, you know, reticular sites, you know, in a reasonable scale. But what turns out is that it depends on the origin of the cells. If you use CD34 from, from cord blood, you make fetal hemoglobin, which is not unexpected, right? Because that's a developmental stage where you make a lot of fetal hemoglobin. Whereas if you do the same experiment with uh, CD34 cells from bone marrow or peripheral blood, you make hemoglobin A. So that switch of globins is really developmentally determined at the development stage at which you're getting the stem cells. And recently, some people have done a lot of work on what Peter talked about, embryonic and iPS cells, and there they exclusively make embryonic globins and fetal hemoglobin. And the big problem with those iPS cells, they, in uh, cord blood and peripheral blood, we are repeatedly shown we can get 60 to 70% enucleation, even in the absence of stromal cells. In embryonic stem cells, there's less than 5% enucleation. They get to the differentiation and they stop there. So again, this is a problem if you're going to use iPS cells to make a transferable product. And finally, the same group uh, in France actually had a paper in blood a few years ago where they took uh, uh, peripheral har harvested cells from a donor and then grew reticular sites from this same donor and reinfused it back to the donor so that it's not autologous uh, transfusion. I didn't mention it's only they could generate one, mic one ml of blood. Huh? After all this effort, they got one ml of blood, but they're able to label it and show they survive reasonably well. So I think it's a proof of concept that you can, in fact, make the cells. And uh, so basically, I think let me uh, conclude by saying, although this can be done on paper and everybody takes a million CD34 cells and they say I can get 10 to the power 4, 10 to the power 5 amplifications, so all I have to do is scale up. Scaling up is a big problem, you know. You know, going to, now, right now, I know for a fact, uh, uh, David Anstey's group in Bristol and Luc Dier's group in uh, Paris, they got a lot of money, you know, 5 to 10 million euros uh, each for uh, doing, and their hope is the next few years, they'll be able to infuse uh, 20 ml of red cells. Or to show that. So, you know, you're seeing what the issues are in this. So, I, I'm less optimistic than my friend Peter, 
I, it, a decade or two decades is a minimum, I think, before we'll actually have, huh, I think, because of a lot of these issues, I think, quality control, scalability, and also you really have to get this enucleation problem solved because you don't want to in infuse a lot of nucleated red cells into the, uh, into the people because it will be disastrous for the transfusion uh, and survival of these things. So, sorry for running late, but I really missed, uh, took, I, I had only 35 slides, huh? I had only 35 slides. I'm very careful because when, when you say 30 minutes, I learned, like, told my student, you don't put more than 30 slides. One minute a slide and some of it. <laughs> so anyway, but I think at the same time, though, I want to be, uh, I, Peter, I agree completely with Peter. I think these are issues that we need to address. I think the more basic knowledge we get about erythropoiesis and what are the factors involved, what is regulating enucleation, what is regulating progenitor proliferations and all, I think this basic information will eventually get us to where we want to go, but we are far from getting there. So thank you very much. John Wu Children's Hospital. Uh, Dr. Nala, very interesting talk. Thank you very much. Uh, I wonder if you have any comments uh, since we're using. Uh, to decrease transfusion requirements in like thalassemia patients. Do you have any comments on the use yeah. of that? Actually, I know I've been following the. the uh, yeah, I've been following the data. The, the effect is real. You know, I think this drug, whatever it is doing, how it is acting, is very clear. It is increasing the hemoglobin, maybe one or two grams, huh, in thalassemia patients. And now there's some evidence it may also be working in MDS, myelodysplasia too. There's ongoing clinical trials. The mechanism is very confusing to me, you know, because in the case of thalassemia, the only way you can do that would be actually re-initiating fetal hemoglobin synthesis especially in beta thal major patients because they don't have any beta globin to synthesize. So that either make F or A2 to uh, reduce the imbalance between alpha and beta chains. But they claim it's not doing that, so I don't know what the mechanism is. And the other thing would be that somehow this is actually increasing the proliferation of the progenitor cells. Uh, so more are able to escape uh, to make red cells. But it, the, con uh, the mechanism is unclear, but the effect is real in thalassemia. But other thing you, uh, somebody told me recently, which makes some sense to me, is whether maybe this active inhibitor is also working on macrophages. Huh? Because macrophages play a critical role both in erythropoiesis, production of red cells, as well as destruction of red cells, where they're somehow modifying the macrophage phenotype in these patients. That's something worth looking into, and some of the people, I think, are going to be doing that in the near future. But the effect is very clear, yeah. So um, there are some uh, restoration solutions out there for red cells that, um, that restore the 2,3-DPG. Um, uh, and phenotypically, those cells look normal because they resume their discoid shape. But your research suggests that they s would still have deformability issues and be cleared by the, the spleen. Is that it? I think you're right. I agree with your assessment of the data. Actually, in the studies in the spleen system in Paris, they actually took the same unit, restored it, and put it back, and there's really no difference in their clearance. Mm -hmm. Clearly, 2 3 dpg will be, huh? what our cells are going through, they're going to deliver more oxygen for sure, because of 2 3 dpg levels, but in terms of overall survival, I'll be very dubious that it's going to make any big difference. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mohan. That was really great. And you gave a, you gave a very good lead in to our, to our next speaker, who's uh, Dr. Jamie Perrette from, uh, from here at UBC in the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering. And Jamie's been, uh, been working for quite a long time to look at some of these 
these technical challenges that exist in, in issues around uh, cell production, protein production, scale up, and, th and that sort of thing. So he's going to talk to us today a bit about some of the interesting work that's been going on uh, in the Michael Smith Laboratories at UBC, uh, for which he's leading on uh, Raman spectroscopy uh, use in cellular therapies. Jamie. Thank you. I appreciate this invitation. I know many of you uh, through the years at UBC, but I've never had a chance to be part of this symposium. And uh, so I, I must say it's an honor to be part of something associated with Bethune um, as somebody who was so courageous, courageous in the face of fascism and the terrors of his time. And despite the fact that his political masters in, in Spain and in uh, China turned out to be monsters themselves, right, the communists. So I'll um, try to introduce uh, cell therapy in general. The only other thing I want to say about him is uh, he might not have been trained as such, but as an innovator, he was really an engineer in spirit, like me. <laughs> and that's a marvelous thing, of course. Um, <clears throat> so I'll try to introduce cell therapy in general, um, but maybe uh, show you a little bit more of an emphasis on the, uh, the challenges. And then I'll focus some on Raman spectroscopy um, that uh, we've applied in this context. And then finally end up with a battleship and a cruise missile since uh, Donald Rumsfeld has been such a topic earlier today. <clears throat> um, so here, uh, Tanya Bubla is a great professor at University of Alberta, a lawyer uh, who works in the analysis of, of the social sciences associated with this field. And here in clinicaltrial.gov, she published in 2014 uh, an enumeration of the number of clinical trials that were being initiated over the years uh, related to stem cells. And it's referred to as novel stem cell trials because she excluded everything to do with hematopoietic stem cells, since that's something already in clinical practice and actually has many, many more clinical trials, but obscures what was happening in the background. And you can see here, really interestingly rising steeply right around the time that human embryonic stem cells were described. Um, uh, just an explosion in the number of clinical trials related to stem cells. Um, the red parts of those curves interestingly show an industrial involvement also increasing over that time. And that's a nice illustration of how this is moving towards, you know, potentially the marketplace uh, with this increasing investment from uh, companies. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, a majority of these are actually mesenchymal stem cell trials. And in fact, those have generally not been very successful. Um, but a number of them have, and it is moving forward. And these, this is the sort of really radical change that is going to take some time to come to fruition. What's exploded uh, most recently, the most uh, interesting area in cellular therapies is related to cellular immunotherapies, and in particular CAR T cell uh, trials, where Tanya has put together another uh, piece of work here that's actually only in the submitted stage. And you can see, likewise, an explosion in the number of clinical trials. It's not shown here, but there's also an increasing amount of industrial involvement, uh, um, you know, investments on the order of tens of billions of dollars uh, for these treatments that are, for at least limited cases of blood cancers, actually, um, uh, uh, basically taking people who are beyond options and uh, putting them in clinical trials and having on the order of 80% uh, success rates in a number of them. So. Of course, uh, in general, uh, cellular therapies are really something very ambitious, uh, seeking to cure diseases such as cancers, um, uh, diabetes, uh, things that are really uh, incurable um, uh, and in many cases enormous economic burdens to our healthcare systems, where we can hope that although a transplant itself uh, might cost a quarter of a million dollars, that will be by far uh, economically uh, worthwhile if it can eliminate a, a lifetime of not only treating the symptoms of diabetes, but the terrible side effects of diabetes that include uh, a substantial shortening of life expectancy of type 1 diabetics. So, so I, I also like to admit that m much of this, in a sense, is science fiction, right? We, we haven't done it yet. Uh, there's a lot of potential here, but there's also a lot of a, a track record, and I actually uh, can't help but admit that I added the next line there, that uh, currently millions, of course, are treated by transfusion medicine that involves cells, and uh, I don't need to tell you guys about that. 
Um, but also, over a million patients have been treated by hematopoietic stem cells to regenerate bone marrow, usually associated with cancer treatment. And that, of course, um, is, an, is a remarkable use of actually cells as therapy. Um, although I would say that both that as well as, from what I understand, blood transfusion would be a, and I'm not sure if I'm right in the regulatory sense, but it would be minimally manipulated, right? It's a homologous use of the substance, not, not grown in culture and so forth, whereas the cell therapy that I'm talking about is cell therapy where one would be expanding the number of cells, sometimes changing their function and so forth. And so there, the example that's related to that is um, in particular been associated with something called tissue engineering over the years. And tissue engineering um, in the 90s um, led to, uh, in particular, skin replacement products for wound care, such as in diabetes, where wounds do not heal on, on feet and, and uh, extremities. And there, uh, you know, starting from human foreskin fibroblasts, uh, football field size, uh, uh, numbers of cells are generated to create um, things like uh, apograph um, that are used in these applications. So there is a case where cells, actually probably more mature cells, are being uh, multiplied in very great numbers. And <clears throat> so that's also very much true in the case of the immunotherapies, where um, this is also something from Tanya Bubla's work, where she's showing that with the blue lines, those are culture and expanded cells, so they'll, they'll grow those cells about uh, 10 days or so. Um, the, for CAR T, uh, they're genetically modified. These are genetically in engineered cells, so they're um, actually genetically engineered to express the chimeric antigen receptor. And of course, that means this is gene therapy, um, and they're activated in various ways. And so those are all uh, substantial manipulations of these cells. Those are all um, things that involve risks. Um, if uh, one is dealing with billions of cells, what if some of them don't respond as expected? So I'll, I'll be addressing how we're um, seeking to, to really look forward and try to, to um, address these kinds of risks uh, in a, a relatively unique way. And this is all in the context of uh, diabetes therapy, is where we have chosen to start. And um, that originates in some sense from the uh, Edmonton Protocol that was developed in uh, Edmonton, of course, by Shapiro and others, where uh, they take um, cells from cadaveric donors, uh, from motorcycle accidents and such, and uh, they put uh, those, uh, the pancreas through a ball mill uh, with an enzyme treatment to break them up and recover the approximately 1% of cells that are actually islets that express um, uh, insulin in order to regulate blood glucose levels. And then they can infuse those uh, allogeneically into recipient uh, uh, diabetics in such a way that um, putting them in the hepatic portal vein, uh, they lodge themselves into the liver uh, in such a way that um, they can control blood glucose. And the Edmonton protocol involved using less toxic uh, immunosuppressive regimes and also um, something very appealing uh, to an engineer, a very practical way of achieving much higher success than people had in the past. They really went from 10% to 100% success in some senses. Um, by, if it didn't work with one cadaveric donor, they'd use another one. If that wasn't enough, they'd use another one. And often they would use either two or three uh, donors on average, and they would reverse diabetes. So <clears throat> that is, uh, I think, a great example of how cell therapies um, can uh, have a huge impact. But there are many challenges that remain uh, in that area, and I think they're representative of many of the ones in cell therapies. So <clears throat> I've also worked with Chris McCabe at University of Alberta, and he's a healthcare economist. And uh, through the analysis, um, actually he had us doing the estimation of how much does it cost to produce human ES derived cells for diabetes cell therapy. And I was always a little troubled with that, you know, hmm, how, how well can I estimate those costs? Uh, I don't actually do this. Um, but in fact, it turned out not to be uh, that important because of the cost of production of the cells, the scale up of that production that I heard referred to earlier, that's not a huge problem. That's what we do all the time. And, and so I don't think that'll be the greatest of problems. And, and it wasn't in this case. The main problem from a healthcare cost point of view was if you're going to maintain somebody on immunosuppression for their entire life, the risks and, and treatments associated with that, as well as all, well, the host of costs of that make this uh, uh, um, non-reimbursable, basically, something that is just not viable in our healthcare system. 
and so um, immunosuppression is the elephant in the room in many cell therapies. Immunosuppression is something that we need to address. And indeed, in the case of even the Edmonton protocol, within about five years, something like 90% of those diabetics are injecting insulin again. They need insulin again. Although they start out as brittle diabetics, great difficulty in controlling their blood glucose. And when they start injecting insulin again, normally they are no longer brittle diabetics. So their lives are improved enormously. And <clears throat> so even though they're back on insulin, it's not as bad as that sounds. So I, I won't talk about it today, but one of the projects that I'm involved in, uh, really with a dream team of uh, groups from around the world that the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation uh, supports, is developing technologies where we immunoisolate transplanted cells by physical means in order to at least reduce and hopefully eliminate the need for immunosuppression. And as I've said, I think that's just a key uh, to moving these therapies forward. Another problem is that there's a limited donor base. Not that many people uh, you know, are brain dead uh, coming in from motorcycle accidents. And it's been estimated that at least 100 times uh, more cells would be needed. And so uh, I've been involved in all sorts of work to try to generate more cells um, for this purpose. And I'll talk about uh, actually the successes of a colleague of mine uh, in a few slides. And then finally, um, a, a real concern that I think is, is underfunded, uh, and actually I've just applied to a borough's welcome uh, fund for regulatory sciences that makes the case that granting agencies generally don't fund um, regulatory sciences enough. You know, they'll fund, uh, and, and all of us will tend to fund a proposal that, that proposes to cure a disease rather than a proposal that suggests, well, there are risks here, and so we should develop technologies to avoid those. It's just, uh, you'll, you'll fund the cure most often. And, and um, you know, I must admit, I, uh, I haven't always succeeded when I uh, submit these proposals. <clears throat> and uh, although I did last week, so we just got a collaborative health research project to support this Raman spectroscopy work. So here we are um, with a situation that I like to contrast with my, my original training is in Chinese hamster ovary production of recombinant proteins, which is at the foundation of the biotechnology industry. So production of erythropoietin, TPA, GCSF, uh, all kinds of proteins that are used as biologics um, and are uh, at the foundation of a almost $200 billion per year industry currently. So that, those are the established protein products, the established protein biologics. They are complex. Uh, that's why they're called biologics. They cannot be fully characterized. But their complexity simply pales in comparison, of course, to cellular therapy products. Uh, one cell has something like a million proteins of thousands of different types. Um, and when we do cellular therapies, we're most often providing a, a billion or 10 billion cells. So, uh, the, the, and, and of varied types and so forth. Established protein products have demonstrated safety. Many risks remain to be addressed in cellular therapy. Immunogenicity is a problem with uh, protein biologics where uh, it, it can block the continued use of these recombinant products, um, in particular because of aggregation of some of them, antibodies in particular. Uh, but that's just not as big a problem as immune rejection, which of course is a huge obstacle for us. Protein products are from what are supposed to be monocultures and essentially are compared to uh, stem cell based cultures or even uh, more mature cultures that are mixed in their composition and even some cell types differentiated into other cell types. Uh, some cell types arise that don't exist inside the body. So huge uh, challenges in addressing that. And then finally, uh, we do um, have the scale up need uh, in the protein production industry and maybe someday in cellular therapy. But actually the most interesting area for people like me is how do you scale down? How do you scale down so that you would be able to handle in a room like this the, the cultures of 100 patients? And so we're, we're in the process of developing closed systems that allow us to handle these products in, um, in a way that uh, eliminates the problems with cross-contamination and so forth. And if you need to do something in a closed system, that represents a lot of technology barriers. You know, you can't pipette things in and out. You can't use a regular centrifuge and so forth. So I'm, I'm very, very much involved in uh, aspects of that. How to, how to wash, how to concentrate and wash cells. It sounds mundane, but uh, it's the passion of my life these days. 
but another one is, is really to do what we can to try to address, uh, in some ways, preemptively, the risks associated with these extremely complex um, uh, products um, and uh, complicated mixed populations. Um, here, uh, these risks are compounded by the fact that uh, therapies like CAR T cell therapies are performed with serum. So you have lot to lot as well as prion dangers associated with serum. You have patient variability. You have all kinds of challenges. And yet there are hundreds of clinical trials that are moving forward with many types of cells and processes. And perhaps one of the adverse uh, events or, or the set of them that you might have heard of is uh, Juno Therapeutics is one of the leading companies in the CAR T cell therapy area down in Seattle. I have three of my trainees that work there. And they are, and um, they, the, the, uh, the clinical, lead clinical trial that they have um, had two of their patients die from cerebral edema. And, um, and that halted the trial for a period of time. They, they managed to have two arms of the trial where it seemed like it was just associated with one arm, so it was reinitiated. And again, I think in October of uh, this past year, they had two more deaths. And so that trial is uh, pretty much shut down. It's in a context where I don't actually know the specific numbers, it's, but it's one of these trials where you're, you're taking people that have run out of options um, in their uh, blood cancer, and, um, and essentially they are leukemia. They are, um, they are uh, reversing the disease now, I think, up to six years um, for 80% uh, of those individuals. And uh, just a fraction of them are dying. And I shouldn't say just because that's just unacceptable. And, and especially since there are other CAR T therapies that are moving forward without these incidents, uh, the regulatory agencies are, are quite uh, uh, rigorous uh, to stop them down at, at this stage. So I think, I think the cell therapy field is, is conscious and, and concerned uh, to look back and see past incidents that have have blocked the emergence of these kinds of fields. And gene therapy, of course, is a good example where an overdose in one case, um, as well as uh, oncogenic insertions in, um, I think, four out of 20 uh, children uh, in the case of uh, another trial, um, led really to setting back that field for something like 10 years or more. Uh, now it's re-emerging, but it, it is something that set it back. And then also the, the polio uh, uh, vaccine cutter incident uh, is a classic example where, where uh, uh, children were given uh, polio in their vaccines. Uh, there were deaths and uh, it's, um, it's something that almost set back that whole effort. And so those, those kinds of challenges have led regulatory agencies to um, apply very rigorous methods when it comes to biologics that are not like aspirin, something you can purify and characterize to the nth degree. Um, and so uh, one of the aspects of that is that both the product needs to be characterized as much as possible, as well as the process. So the process needs to follow a pattern that is identical each, or, or within defined ranges each time so that you can validate that you're producing the same material as was tested in the clinical trials to be safe and efficacious. And so <clears throat> we're uh, basically interested in those kinds of process analytical technologies in this new field, uh, looking to define product identity, purity, safety, potency, um, where the current uh, sort of state of the art is to use what we would generally use in our laboratories, which is you know, periodic analysis of sampled cell uh, morphology is one thing, but also messenger RNA and protein markers that are indicative of, for instance, cells differentiating from human ES cells to beta cell progenitors. And that is, of course, extremely valuable and, and is something that we can only seek to complement with um, methods that we hope would improve process validation by providing online analysis of the culture during the process, ideally non-invasive, um, ideally by a method that's different than looking at the, the proteins and the messenger RNA orthogonal, you know, something that's a, a different way to analyze something related. Um, and, and that kind of dual analysis or, or combined analysis gives a, a, robust, a robustness to the validation that's uh, really uh, uh, valuable. Um, <clears throat> and then I have this little image on, on the side of the slide, which is from Kaiser Optical. They're a company in the, in the biotechnology industry that's developed Raman spectroscopy sensors 
to analyze for things like uh, glucose and lactates, as well as just viable cell concentration. So, so that's an illustration that there are um, applications of this uh, kind of technology. And we're very much interested in Raman spectroscopy um, because it has the potential to be an analytical technology also for the cells and what kind of cells you have in one's culture. Um, it's a reagentless, label-free, non-destructive technology, um, and it uh, can use sensors to enable in-process measurements of actually the cell composition of cells. Um, competing sorts of technologies might be light absorbance that has far less information, uh, infrared that um, is, um, is uh, uh, basically doesn't work very well in the presence of water that obscures a lot of the signal, as well as NMR analysis would be another approach where Unfortunately, you need a substantial sample, and, and there are other challenges there. And so we've been doing a lot of work, and when I say we, uh, this is in collaboration with Robin Turner and the Michael Smith Labs, as well as Mike Blades in chemistry at UBC, who are just brilliant Raman spectroscopists. I'm the sort of bioprocess engineer in the, in the gang. And uh, we've analyzed, uh, used this to analyze uh, differentiating states of cells, uh, shifts in physiology to detect, for instance, the onset of on, uh, autophagy, uh, cell death modes, um, as well as subcellular features, where this is a nice illustration of the nucleus of an MCF7 um, nucleus, where the protein is in red and the DNA is in black, and the RNA-rich regions are actually the uh, ribosomal manufacturing sort of site within the nucleus that, that we refer to as the nucleolus. So, Essentially, there's, it's a microscopic technology that is based on uh, Raman scattering. So f for those of you that have forgotten, uh, Raman scattering is associated with um, basically light is scattered at the same wavelength uh, almost all of the time as, uh, as it strikes uh, an object. But about one out of a million or one out of a hundred million photons will, uh, will be scattered at a different wavelength. Uh, normally leaving a, behind a bit of, an en of the energy, uh, activating uh, uh, a particular um, uh, chemical bond. Um, and that is something that can be used in Raman spectroscopy in order to distinguish the kinds of chemicals or the kind of chemical bonds actually that are in a particular sample. And so here there's a, a contraption that, uh, that we use to basically put samples under a microscope and then on the side of this figure, you can see a, um, there we are, so maybe I'll give it one more try. Nope. Um, uh, you can see uh, uh, benzene, okay? This is the uh, easy part. So benzene uh, has a very strong uh, signal uh, in Raman spectroscopy where essentially the shift in the wavelength of the light that's emitted um, that's different than the incident light is, has peaks that are associated with, uh, I think this is a breathing mode, and that's a, um, that's a uh, they call it a twist uh, mode. So different sort of energy so it's associated with essentially motions within these molecules that give rise to peaks uh, in the Raman spectra. So benzene is not what we're analyzing. We're analyzing mammalian cells, so maybe the Raman shift spectra will be a little more complicated. And I'll, I'll break that to you uh, one step at a time by showing you first here peaks that are associated with uh, lipids um, that can distinguish to some extent the content of lipids uh, that exist at any particular point in the sample. The, the absolute uh, value of those lipid peaks is larger, so that works better than it would appear here where all these are normalized to one. Um, proteins, uh, you can see the phenylalanine side chain that actually corresponds to that benzene peak that I uh, pointed out to you. Also uh, glycogen and nucleic acids. So what we're looking at here are the predominant macromolecules inside of these cells. And so <clears throat> essentially what one can do is take human embryonic stem cells, differentiate them, analyze the Raman spectra before and after, and one gets a collection of peaks that show significant shifts in the lipid-associated, protein-associated, nucleic acid-associated, and so forth peaks. Here's the, the phenylalanine one uh, that's labeled as a protein-associated one. And so <clears throat> essentially what we can do is analyze, uh, normally we look at ratios of peaks in order to normalize uh, the amount of material in a particular sample. And that allows us to, uh, when differentiating human embryonic stem cells, 
for instance, uh, track an increase of threefold in the protein to nucleic acid ratio of cells as they go from blast cells that are mostly nucleus to a cell that has a big cytoplasm. This is a shift that one would expect. Um, you can imagine from a safety point of view, one might still be able to detect individual human ES cells that remain, so that that would be valuable uh, for monitoring. It could also detect, uh, you know, from the greater amount of information there, uh, unanticipated deviations in the type of cells produced. So if a cell arises that has a very high lipid level, that's something that could be detected and probably wouldn't have been one of those proteins or nucleic or, uh, messages that uh, would have been in the standard analysis. So we, we have an unbiased analysis that can be done here. And then finally, dry fixed uh, samples would allow us to, to store these samples and for instance in clinical trials, um, basically retain them and use them and do detailed analysis if and when there are adverse events to see if we might have an analytical method that could allow us to, to avoid those adverse events in the future. So I'm going to have to go a bit fast here, but uh, it's, um, this is essentially a great publication by Tim Kiefer at uh, UBC, uh, where he's worked with Beta Logics on the development of one of the most sophisticated, I, I think it is, uh, the most sophisticated uh, uh, ability to go from human embryonic stem cells to beta cell progenitors that when transplanted into animals differentiate to regain control of blood glu glucose levels. We, in culture, we can't get them to beta cells, but you put them into animals and within two, three months, they will differentiate uh, to become fully functional. So these are just examples of the Raman spectra that would allow us uh, through these ratios to detect the kind of profiles that we expect for particular peak ratios that, for instance, here can distinguish the kind of profile that you would expect, uh, for instance, for this pink line in the early stages and then longer term shifts of this type such as uh, ones that are associated with glycogen uh, increases. So we're, we're really working on this as a process analytical technology where we'd want to define normal ranges and, and uh, thereby be able to uh, track these systems in a north, with an orthogonal uh, sort of method. And um, uh, maybe I'll just skip a, to this slide. So, so one of the challenges is that one measures everything about the cells uh, when we're doing Raman spectroscopy. We're not focusing on a particular message. And so very often uh, when we're sent samples, uh, we start sending back questions to the person who sent us the sample because it's not the same as the last sample and it, very often we find methodological changes that cause them, uh, like for human ES, how they are passaged influences very much their glycogen level. So that's great. It gives us insights, but it's also a challenge. We have all these things happening in the background. And for instance, in any culture, you would have some cell death. And so what we've done is we've focused on various aspects of that type over the last few years. For instance, here, in Shreyas Rangan has done work on analyzing cell uh, death, um, in this case by apoptosis, where these would be um, uh, just the nuclei, and then when an exon 5 is expressed on the surface, the cells become green. And then when the cells become so-called necrotic or late-stage apoptotic, um, they, um, they become red. And essentially what we've done is um, in, induce apoptosis and then analyzed uh, in these populations uh, differences in the Raman spectra um, comparing uninduced, which is the black line, that's the high one here, to Campitocin-induced apoptosis cells that are either in this group or in this group. And so here, these are ones that conventional flow cytometry would not be able to detect as apoptotic, whereas here, the uh, annexin-5 negative are quite similar to the annexin-5 positive. So we actually haven't, not only are, are we interested to determine these kinds of variations, we're finding that we can get measurements that in some ways are superior to uh, conventional methods to analyze these. Many people in this field use principal component analysis, and it's true, you can separate the populations where the blue and the red are separate and so forth. Our bias is to work as much as possible with specific peaks and specific ratios of peaks. Um, because we prefer to know something about the biological basis, the biochemical basis of what we're measuring. And indeed, we're able to then go on and, for instance, in this case, um, actually we couldn't, uh, we didn't uh, capture a significant difference in the, the DNA content, but actually uh, did uh, detect a significant difference in the RNA content. 
These are not uh, you know, one to one correlated. Um, these measurements will not give you accurate measurements of quantities, um, but you can see that the trends are confirmed and indeed from a process analytical technology point of view, it might well be that we've simply discovered a method that should be used through classic biochemical analysis uh, as a validation that one has the right kind of cells. So, so I think I'll, um, I, I've said most of what I want to say, so I won't do that. I'll just skip to Donald Rumsfeld and uh, say, uh, in summary, I think there's huge potential. Don't get me wrong about these risks. This is just terrific. We, uh, if, if just some of this could be successful, we could set back, uh, you know, diabetes in millions or cancer in, in thousands. Uh, the potentials here are enormous. But we're also at a critical early phase of bioprocess innovation for the production of these, these products, both the process and the production process. And I, I like this peculiar battleship uh, analogy here because I come from the field where we work on antibody production. And so in a way, cruise missiles are like antibodies. They're these highly sophisticated, targeted weapons that you know, one can hope you know, can go and win wars. But if you've been watching the news for the past 20, 30 years, it doesn't work all that well. And regrettably, antibodies, though they are extremely effective in a few cases in cancers, they have not lived up to our hope in, in curing cancer. We were hoping for so much more in the 70s and 80s, and uh, it really hasn't worked out in many cases. And so, in some sense, now, with cellular therapies, I think we could recapture that hope. And, and what we're doing is we're sending in the battleship. The battleship with all of its weapons, you know, those huge cannons that are obsolete from a modern warfare point of view. Well, cell-cell contact, uh, you know, has everything to do. And, and sending in the battleship means sending in the cells that persist, they divide, they maintain themselves. They can maintain the defense against that cancer. So um, I, I think it is an appropriate analogy from that point of view as well, because obviously the battleship is just unimaginably more complicated than the cruise missile, however complex the cruise missile is. And so I think this kind of captures in my mind a lot of what I hope we are doing. And uh, I just hope our political masters are not monsters, okay? <laughs> So I'm, I'm blessed to be part of CellCan. It's a network of seven, uh, se the main cell, uh, seven cell therapy manufacturing facilities across Canada. Regrettably, we don't have one of these big facilities in Vancouver, but you have the bioengineering leader of CellCan, so you're going to have to settle for that <coughs> until we get a facility. Um, and uh, very finally, uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, there are lots of funding agencies here, um, but really this is uh, NSERC uh, supported. Um, and uh, um, uh, Robin Turner and Mike Blades I already mentioned, Tim Kiefer as well. Uh, Stan uh, Konarov is the experimentalist in Raman spectroscopy. George Schultz is the analytics guy, the computational uh, one, as well as Shreyas and Chris. Um, and then with the human ES work, uh, Corinne Hursley, who's a professor at McGill now, as well as Blair Gage and uh, Saper Kamal. So thanks very much for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions. <laughs> Thanks, that was a great talk. Um, that's really interesting technology that is coming about. Um, I just have a question about how high throughput that technology is. So how many cells are you actually analyzing um, within each measurement? How mm -hmm. long does each measurement take? Mm -hmm. And then also, mm -hmm. you know, if it is high throughput, I believe you're using, are you using fixed cells or live cells? So, so the, this work was fixed cells, okay. and you're absolutely right. It can take you know a few minutes, if not uh, hours, to get the most detailed analysis mm -hmm. of an individual cell. But uh, what uh, will save us there is a, a CFI a grant a couple of years ago that has us setting up, uh, rather than spontaneous Raman spectroscopy, one can use stimulated Raman spectroscopy. You don't get that whole spectrum, you get a narrow range, and we're usually picking up peak ratios where they're within that narrow range. And that, you can capture the information at, at video frame rates. So you could watch a cell moving around and so forth. But in the application analyzing uh, uh, for cell therapy, one would want to be able to scan over cells. So if it, they were anchorage dependent cells, one could scan over them and potentially look at thousands, if not millions of cells. It's still a sample, mm -hmm. um, but uh, actually now the sample is taken out. It's part of the cells that go into the patient. So it's, a, it's something that we're hoping uh, would address the, the appropriate issues that you're bringing up. Thank you.
Which one? No, we were talking about number of cells. The reason I said what I said is trillions of cells. In your case, of diabetes. How, how many? Yeah, the little one milliliter right. or so is something on the order of a billion okay. cells. Right. No, the, in case of transfusion, is really the numbers game. It's a much bigger numbers game than uh, some of the stem yeah. cell therapies. And stuff. So, of course, there would be costs associated. There would be costs associated with larger scale, so you're absolutely right about that. But, uh, but uh, it's, uh, I'm, I'm concerned about these other risks. Um, sure. Yeah. And, and costs is what engineers handle, so leave that to us. If you can start curing people of diabetes, we'll deal with the costs. Uh, you know, I'm not providing any guarantees, but uh, let's, let's get there first. <coughs> okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. Great. Okay. So before lunch, sort of as a tradition, in the CBR symposia, to give uh, poster presenters a um, a chance to come up and give a teaser on what they're um, what they're presenting. So we ask all the poster presenters to line up. Come on, you guys know the routine. Come on, hustle, 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 because people are hungry. Can I line up over that side? All right. Come on over here, over here. Okay, and Geraldine, you can you can start. I'm always first. Yeah. Okay. Go for it. Hello everybody, my name is Krista klein -Bosgoed. I'm a graduate student in the lab of Dr. Dana Devine. And today I present a poster where I look at the impact of uh, P38 at, uh, and its role in uh, the protection of mRNA in platelets, especially exposed after riboflavin and UV. Uh, since platelets are a nucleate, they need to protect their mRNA through their entire lifespan to be able to synthesize proteins. And that's especially interesting with those uh, uh, pathogen inactivation techniques that are designed to specifically target um, bacterial, viral, and parasitic RNA and DNA. Um, and the platelet mRNA is an uh, innocent bystander. Um, so we have pop um, uh, so we hypothesize that P38 is a, uh, plays a role in its protection. So if you would like to learn more, please come and view my poster. It's number 19. Thank you. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Anoli Da Silva and I'm a graduate student from the Kim Lab and we're interested in studying the uh, mechanisms of platelet apoptosis. Um, one of the problems with assessing apoptosis in platelets is that uh, some of the features are also occurring in platelet activation such as phosphatidylserine exposure. And so we optimize conditions to selectively induce apoptosis and uh, without inducing activation in platelets. Um, in addition, we're also interested in studying the uh, molecular mechanism of apoptosis in platelets. And so uh, for that, we're interested in looking at the role of filament A, which is an actin binding protein. And um, uh, we, it, it's been previously shown that uh, filament A protects nucleated cells against force-induced apoptosis. Uh, so in terms of platelets, we're interested in, uh, we're hypothesizing that uh, filament A promotes platelet survival by uh, regulating its interaction with GP1B, von Willebrand factor, and uh, 1433. So if you're interested in learning more about this topic, please come visit me at poster number 16. Thanks. Hi, good afternoon everyone. My name is Umeya Mara and I'm a postdoctoral research fellow in the lab of Dr. Hugh Kim. Um, today I'm going to present a poster with the title PF4 driven upregulation of MMP1 in gingival fibroblasts. Uh, I will skip most of my introductory part because Dr. Hugh Kim has explained very well. I will I will skip most of my introductory part because Dr. Hugh Kim has explained very well about the periodontitis diseases. As he said that period, uh, during the uh, periodontitis diseases, platelet factor 4 upregulate MMP1 expression in gingival fibroblasts uh, by inducing MAP kinase signaling. Now we are interested to know which receptors are involved in this signaling and um, uh, what signaling pathway is uh, down there. 
as PF4 become functional in the form of tetramers. So we are, in, we are uh, hypothesizing by blocking of tetramerization, PF4 tetramerization, we could inhibit or we could block the MMP, MMP1 expression in gingival fibroblasts, which could be very, having a therapeutic value in reducing tissue de degradation during periodontitis. If you are interested in my work, come to poster number 24, but don't be confused, I don't have teeth pictures on it. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, hi everyone, my name is Cecilia. I'm a postdoc in Dr. Hugh Kim's lab. And my, uh, the topic of my research is uh, the adhesion and activation of platelets on, uh, mo on uh, modified titanium surfaces. And titanium is now the most widely used material for dental implants and it has been proved that uh, modified uh, titanium uh, dental implant, uh, sorry, titanium uh, dental implant surface modification can increase the uh, uh, integration of uh, uh, the dental implant with the host bone tissue. The underlying mechanism is still not really clear. Uh, and we know that platelets is one of the first cell types which contact to uh, dental implant after surgical implantation. Uh, so our uh, investigation is to trying to evaluate the uh, platelet activation and, uh, uh, um, ad uh, and uh, adhesion on uh, titanium surfaces, which has been treated differently. We use some uh, commercially used methods to treat titanium surfaces, such as sandblasting, dual acid etching, and uh, uh, SLA. If you are interested in my uh, research, please come to my poster, number 23. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Frank Lee. I'm a PhD student in the lab at Prizedale. Uh, the well-established role of factor V is informing blood clots. My project involves uncovering a mechanism by which factor V is involved in the exact opposite in breaking clots down. Um, I've demonstrated a mechanism by which plasmin cleaves activated factor V to accelerate the, the activity of tissue plasminogen activator. Uh, if you'd like to know more about my research and my future plans, uh, please visit me at poster 14. Thank you. Hi, my name is Brian Lin. I'm a PhD candidate in a prize lab, working towards a broad spectrum antiviral strategy. I'm developing an electron microscopy technique to identify host-derived constituents found on the envelope structure of viruses. We believe that these constituents are found on many envelope viruses, and as models, we're using dengue virus and herpes simplex virus. I also show that these constituents are involved in triggering host coagulation, ultimately leading to clotting as well as pathology. Uh, if you'd like to learn more, uh, come visit me at poster number 10. Hi everyone, I'm Vince Sanini. I work with Dr. Kim at the UBC Center for Blood Research. For my project, I look at chronic periodontitis, which is a bacterial oral infection and it affects a large proportion of the adult population. It also has systemic associations with many systemic diseases, most notably uh, thrombosis. Uh, the underlying mechanism by which they interact, however, at the level of blood coagulation is, is largely unknown. So for my project, we've enlisted thromboelastometry to assess uh, blood coagulation dynamics. If you're interested, please see me at uh, presentation 22, and um, I'll show you some of the, the data that we've collected, which is very interesting. We're looking at whole blood samples, venous, from uh, chronic periodontitis patients, and we're seeing that there's reductions in viscoelastic properties and also in uh, clot formation rates. So thank you. Hi, I'm Linda. I'm a PhD candidate in Mark Scott Lab. The uh, current allostimulatory approaches to treating cancers are dangerous because of the presence of the allogenic cells. So in my project, we have manufactured a novel cell-free bioreactor therapeutics, RA1, which promoted a pro-inflammatory T factor cell proliferation and subset differentiation in treated human lymphocytes, and this RA1 activated lymphocytes uh, effectively attenuated the tumor cell proliferation. If you like knowing more details, please come and visit poster number two. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Simon. I'm a PhD student in Dieter Brahms lab. Um, our lab works with K, which is a major bone degrading enzyme in our body. Um, my poster today is going to be talking about um, using multiple docking methods in order to identify um, novel inhibitors of this enzyme in order to tr um, uh, prevent bone resorption. If you want some more information, um, I'm at poster number eight. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Stephanie. I'm a graduate student in Christian Kastrup's lab. Uh, I'm working on a way of using platelets to deliver nucleic acids to sites of damage within the vasculature. So I've shown you can deliver RNA to platelets using lipid nanoparticles. Uh, this doesn't induce significant platelet activation or aggregation, and the RNA is fairly stable, and it's also released upon platelet activation. Uh, so if you'd like to hear more, just see my poster number 18. Thanks. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vivian, and I'm a PhD student in Dr. Christian Kastrup's lab. Um, so similar to what Stephanie was telling you about, um, we work on trying to use platelets to deliver different things. Um, so in our project, in our initial studies, we've shown that we can deliver um, nucleic acids as well as proteins and small molecules to platelets um, in a way that we were able to make a nucleate platelets make a, synth or, sorry, a reporter messenger RNA. Um, so we're looking for different applications now to see what other proteins or small molecules we can uh, deliver to the platelets to potentially make uh, platelet transfusions better. Um, so come visit me at poster seven. Hi, my name is Beverly Bakir and I'm uh, in the Hancock lab at UBC. Um, I study cellular reprogramming. Um, which has been connected to the immune paralysis that you find in sepsis patients. Um, so I, uh, to study this, I basically um, tried, we've reprogrammed uh, cells in vitro and found that they actually start to, uh, they actually express, increase expression of our cellular reprogramming signature. Um, and this is important because our signature we'd like to be able to use as a, as a diagnostic to go on to uh, to predict uh, the development of sepsis in uh, patients admitted into the hospital. Um, I'll be at uh, poster 13 if anybody has additional questions. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Arya, and I'm a student with Dr. Froelich. Um, with lifelong elevation of pl plasma LDL, uh, I've been helping on imp implementing a familiar hypercholesterolemia registry here in British Columbia with a simple goal of uh, diagnosing, treating, and um, educating these individuals with FH. They're at, increase, they're at 20 fold increased risk of premature heart disease and require early intervention. So come to poster one to find out more. My name is Samreen. I'm a graduate student with Dr. Jeff Payne Lab. My research is about finding novel anti-inflammatory compounds from VC wild mushrooms uh, by using both in vitro and in vivo model. In in vitro, I'm using macrophage cell lines, and in vivo model, I'm using mice microcirculation intravital microscopy. If you want to learn more, come visit me in my poster number three. Thank you. Hi, I'm Andrew C. You guys already heard me speak, and I realize I'm the last thing standing between you and the food, so that's a very dangerous place to be, so I'll keep this very brief. So my first poster, really, the premise of it is the idea is that us as blood bankers, we always give clinicians sort of the stink eye and the speech that they should only transfuse one unit of cells at a time and then reassess afterwards. And then during one of these situations, I was giving one of my fellow clinicians the stink eye and then realized I have no idea what the term reassessment means. Uh, so really, my first poster is addressing what is reassessment? And we ask transfusion medicine experts all across Canada what they think it means. Uh, poster number two, kind of related to poster number one, is can you use big data to kind of determine whether or not transfusion, uh, clinicians are on their best behavior in terms of giving one unit at a time? So thank you. <laughs> 